welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Erin Mayo Adam. I'm the director of the LGBTQ Policy Center and a professor of political science uh, at Hunter College. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, this evening's event, The New Generation of Lesbian Bars, A Stonewall Legacy. For the past three decades, the number of lesbian bars in the United States has seen a steady decline. From an estimated 200 at their peak in the 1980s to a low point in 2020 of less than 20 across the country, according to an NBC News report. Since then, according to a more recent NBC News review from August 2023, a dozen new bars have opened, bringing the total number of venues geared towards queer women to 35, signaling a measured revitalization and bringing legitimate hope for an ongoing resurgence. Bar owners and patrons are attributing the uptick to the need for uh, queer and transgender inclusive spaces amidst a flurry of anti-LGBTQ legislative attacks, as well as an evolution towards messaging that is more inclusive of the full spectrum of the LGBTQ community. So tonight's event will explore this resurgence, the evolution of sapphic spaces, and the importance of creating space within the queer and trans community. We're going to begin with a short video that zeroes in on the rise in lesbian bars in Oklahoma. And following the video, I'll introduce each of the panelists and then we'll get into a panel discussion. So without further ado, let's show the short video. My favorite fact to share is that Oklahoma has one of the highest amounts of lesbian bars. I've never felt so safe in my life and like protected by a community. Just to be you and not feel like there are any repercussions because you're being who you want to be and who you are. I feel like Oklahoma politics is very disappointing and discouraging at this time, but I feel like this is a time where we should all rally together and stand up and fight back. I think more people are forcing their way into visibility. They're like, there's nothing wrong with me. I want to be loud. And I feel like we're just like at this cusp of like blowing up in the best way. We are on our way to Alibis for Dyke Night. Gonna go play some pool, hang out with friends, and have a good time. <laughs> Oklahoma City has changed so much in the last few years. We're basically Texas's little sister. <laughs> Who was trying to like get away from the family. I think the queer community has changed in the city because there's been more exposure. We are way more open now. I think that Oklahoma's headed to a good place, especially with all the transplants from other states that are coming in. If you've never come to Alibis and you're walking in for the first time. Yay, hi. I would hope you're, you're walking into somebody's living room or somebody's like home and it's warm and it's chaotic and kind of intense. Oh my gosh but in all the right and wrong ways at one time. Whether or not you came for my birthday, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I felt more love and support from this community than I ever truly felt with my family. And I think that that's why it became so important to me. And I wanted everybody else to see it the way that I saw it because a lot of people I see don't have family. I wouldn't be who I am without alibis giving us this safe space to be exactly who we are. So this is what I did today. Over my heart, I got Jefferson Park tattooed, that's my neighborhood, and I got alibis right next to it. <laughs> alibis and I are in it for eternity. It was the first lesbian bar I ever went to, and I'll never forget going the first time and walking in and seeing like butches at the bars making drinks and butch and femme couples, uh, different lesbians of um, all types, all around. And I felt so immediately like at peace and like I could show up exactly as I was. And that was so special for me. I'm from uh, North Texas and then I moved here. When I was 18, I went to college at OU. I went to college very Christian. I had kind of doubled down on the Christianity thing in hopes that it would get rid of the gay thing. Um, it did not, but I tried for a while and I decided to stay in Oklahoma because honestly, it just kind of felt like my only option at the time. So handsome. I was really nervous as to how my family was going to respond to me coming out. 
But I came out, I moved to the city, and it was kind of like all of that was just dead and gone, and I didn't look back. My name's Tracy Harris, this is my wife Ann Harris. We both own Frankie's. Me and my friends started coming up probably when I was 19 because I was a slow bloomer. And then the bars that were there then, most of them aren't here now. But it was super exciting at the time to find a place where there were other lesbians. It was awesome. It was a pretty dangerous time, kind of like it's getting again. All the bars on the strip, which is where most of the bars were, uh, have parking lots in the back because it was just way too dangerous to park on the street. Not just because you could get mugged or hurt or killed, but somebody could just see you and, and tell on you. There are lots of um, bars that are accepting, even straight bars or a regular bar that has a drag show, but the patrons that go in that establishment may not be as supportive of our community, so, and most of them aren't. So we need more safe spaces. We're a very red state. They just passed the trans law that's devastating. It's the state that we live in. It's where we are. I want the secret to be the spot. I want everyone to be known that they are loved, and we do notice you. We do notice your presence. We want them to feel welcome, um, more like home. The Secret opened April 28, 2023. The lesbian bars were shutting down. That's another motivation. I always want to face the odds. I want to be a trailblazer. And I think that's where I'm always at is, you know, being a minority, it made me like, when someone says no, it's like, there is a yes. You know, there is an opportunity for me, for us, you know, to, to open a lesbian bar. We are headed this morning to Elemental Coffee Shop, um, one of the queer-owned businesses we have in the city. My friendship group right now is like 99% queer. That was not the case years ago, so I am very grateful for that. <laughs> Obviously, Oklahoma is a very red state. Something I always find disheartening is when people from more like liberal states will write off red states or be like, ah, oh, we don't need them. And it just like completely neglects to acknowledge the people who have been here for so long, putting in the work. I think the Oklahoma City queer community is incredibly resilient. I think that resilience is in a lot of situations born from just the really difficult things we have experienced. Being queer in the South and in Oklahoma in particular, we've seen some things and we've been through some things and we know how hard it can be being queer here. And so I think that like, there is this nature of just welcoming queer people with open arms. And I think that's really special and that's why I stayed. If a stranger comes in, you They're them. not a stranger yeah, for them. very long. <laughs> All right, so for, I'm going to introduce everyone in alphabetical order. So first we have Wanda Acosta. Um, Wanda is a stalwart icon in uh, lesbian life, nightlife in downtown New York. She has been creating and producing events in New York City for 30 years. She was an owner of Wonder Bar, Starlight, and Clubhouse in Manhattan's East Village. And she has also worked with a diverse range of clients in media, including the new festival, Showtime's The L Word, uh, the L Word and nonprofit organizations such as GLAAD and the Heatrick Martin Institute. And most recently, she was awarded the Community Advocacy Award from the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. So we'd like to welcome uh, Wanda. And, and next we have Angela Barnes. Uh, Angela is the co-owner of Nobody's Darling, a woman-owned, woman-centered cocktail bar in the Andersonville neighborhood of Chicago. In 2021, Nobody's Dar Darling was a James Beard Award finalist. Uh, which is really excellent. Um, 
Angela stands at the intersection of race, gender, and sexual orientation to help guide the strategic thinking and direction of the nonprofit, nonprofit organizations for which she's, she has had the privilege of serving as a board director, including the Center on Halstead, Chicago Coalition for Homelessness, GLAAD, Chicago Leadership Council, and SGA Youth and Family Services. In 2020, she was also appointed to the Racial Justice Diversity Committee for the Northern District of Illinois. And Angela also holds a law degree from Columbia University and a Bachelor's of Arts from w Wellesley College. So we'd like to uh, welcome Angela. Uh, and, and next we have Alex Berg. Uh, Alex is an on-air host, creative director, and multimedia journalist who recently wrote uh, a feature about uh, lesbian and queer women owned bars for NBC Out. All of the uh, in, uh, individuals, aside from, of course, uh, Stacey Lentz, were featured in Alex's article, and Alex really brought this event uh, to us, so we're really thrilled uh, to be able to host her. Uh, Al Alex recently served as a, a director and producer of the documentary series Authentic Voices of Pride for LGBTQ Nation, and as the host of Lambda Legal's inaugural podcast, Making the Case. Alex's work has been received has received Anthem, Shorty, and Muse Awards, was nominated for GLAAD Media Awards, and screened by Newfest. And Alice has also been recognized as an honoree in the Weebies News and Politics category. So uh, welcome, Alex. And, and next, we're really excited to uh, welcome Kathy Jack. Uh, Kathy is the Director of Operations for Craven Enterprises, Inc., which owns Sue Ellen's, the oldest lesbian bar in Texas, along with many other uh, gay bars. Kathy has lived in Dallas for over six decades, where she works as a manager of Sue Ellen's, and Kathy has been a leader in the LGBTQIA plus community for over 40 years. And she has spent much of her life managing lesbian bars in Dallas and owned her own restaurant bar with her wife of 27 years uh, uh, from 2008 to 2012. So we're really excited to have Kathy with us this evening. And then last but not least, we'd like to welcome Stacy Lentz. Stacy is an LGBTQ plus activist, speaker, and co-owner co -owner of the Stonewall Inn, which became the birthplace of the modern gay rights movement after the Stonewall riots in 1969, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, in 2006, uh, Stonewall Inn was closed, and Lentz was part of a team of investors who saved the iconic landmark. Stonewall was named a national monument in 2016, making it the first LGBTQ plus national monument in US history. Uh, Stacy was also a featured rally speaker on the Supreme Court steps, calling on the courts to rule in favor of LGBTQ plus workplace protections. And she is a TEDx speaker and has appeared on various news outlets discussing gay rights and issues affecting the LGBTQ plus community. So we'd like to uh, welcome Stacy as well. All right, so um, as I said, we'll get started with some general questions. So like, my first question is just, what drew, of you, what drew each of you to create and or advocate for the creation of sapphic-focused spaces within the LGBTQ plus community? And why are these spaces so important? <laughs> Anyone can jump in. Um, initially, I was drawn to creating a queer space or a, a sapphic space in the early 90s uh, as I was sort of a little bit of a late bloomer myself coming out and uh, feeling like I really wanted to be visible. And some of the places that were available to me in New York City were still harking back to uh, the 70s and 80s where they were still somewhat hidden or speakeasy types or, you know, behind a restaurant or down in a basement. And um, I really wanted to feel empowered and to be seen. And I didn't find that necessarily. So um, I started a place called Sundays at Cafe Tabac, which was in the East Village that became quite popular. Uh, I felt like there was a need for, um, there was a, there was there was a moment. Uh, I think there was a also like the zeitgeist of what was happening, right? There was this this, this shift in 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 because of the feminist movement and and things that were changing in the city, where queerness and and lesbians were becoming a, more visible and more uh, aware and more somewhat accepted. So we wanted to just be out. 
I think that um, the, the disappearance of spaces for queer women, they were disappearing, but I don't think we were really noticing that on a really in, in a really intentional way. Um, and the, you know, sort of the people who, you know, were friends and you sort of get together with them, it, we realized at some point, oh wait, we, we don't really have anywhere to go. Um, so it, this was almost by accident. Um, my business partner and I, we, the, we were in the midst of the pandemic and as we were kind of, you know, socializing and having cocktails, um, having cocktails and golfing, because it's really all you could do. <laughs> and, you know, we said, we should do, she, I'm gonna give her the credit, she wanted the brick and mortar, um, and we said, we, have, we, we need some place that we feel comfortable being, you know, there and feeling safe. Um, and the opportunity came along, and so you know we we jumped and we did it, and I think that the success it it was it resonated so so well because so many people were feeling the same way because so many people in Chicago they were like oh my God yeah where did all of these places go, um, and that's you know as as everyone's sitting around the bar having cocktails, they're like, and that place closed, and that other place closed, and that, and so thank God this place opened. And I think that's kind of almost by accident, right? We, we opened up. I was just going to say, similar story. I opened Sue Ellen's back in 1989, and at that time, there were many, many, many bars on the, what we call a neighborhood on the block. And I was working in one of the big dance bars as a manager. And as time went on, as I was working there, I was like, women are not represented. Lesbians are not here. I'm the only one. And so I found it very necessary to bec become a very squeaky wheel. My bosses did not like me very much. <laughs> but I wasn't going to stop until it happened. And I went and I got in their faces and I said, I've got people coming to me, I've got women coming to me every night that I'm in the bar and all they want is a place of their own on the same block as everybody else. They don't wanna be in the alleys, they don't wanna be in the basements, they just wanna be on the same level as everybody else where you can come in and be proud and feel safe. So I think the biggest, that was my biggest achievement in my life um, was to finally get Sue Ellen's opened, and it's still open today, 34 years later. So. Well, um, since this was uh, brought up, we talked about um, uh, sort of, uh, we, we talked a bit about, you all talked a bit about um, uh, why they declined and why you think we might, they might be um, emerging a little bit. Let's uh, talk about how they've changed over time. So how do you think the lesbian bars of today differ from those of the past? So for example, much of the reporting points out that they, uh, many bars have become more inclusive spaces for trans and non-binary people. Do you think that's an accurate report? Uh, if so, why do you think um, that's changed? So I think it's super important and you know, um, one of the things that we've tried to do with Stonewall, what I see happening at lesbian bars all across the country, and I think this is indicative of lesbians and our community in general, we tend to be more welcoming to trans and non-binary folks than some of our male counterparts. I know I'm gonna get in trouble for that, but I absolutely believe that's true. <laughs> um, so I think lesbian spaces have led the way around this and have always been more welcoming to trans and non-binary folks. And that started back in 1969, even at Stonewall, right? When you look at trans women of color who, who led part of that riot and the movement. So I think that's super important. And I think a younger generation, especially Gen Z, expects that to happen. Um, and so I think that um, that's super important and I think that we have become more inclusive and I think we'll continue to lead down that front. In New York City, there are 55 bars that identify as specifically gay men bars. 
Um, there's four lesbian. I count Stonewall as an everyone, the church kind of kind of bar, right? Um, but again, if you go on any given night, you're gonna see more trans folks and non-binary folks in what we would call our lesbian spaces. And, and I think because women have just pushed the needle of progressionism in that movement. For my NBC story, um, so one of the things that we found was that a lot of bars now are being really intentional with the way that they're framing themselves. So they might say that they're a dyke bar for the queer community or a lesbian bar for everyone. And really, I think calling out um, that they want to include trans and non-binary folk. And I think that that's also very uh, reflective of uh, Gen Z as well. We know that Gen Z is queerer than all previous generations, or at least they're more out than previous generations, the way that they're defining themselves. So I think a lot of these places are being incredibly intentional. But the reality is that I think in the history of lesbian bars and sapphic spaces, they have always had folks of an infinite number of genders. It's just that now I think that we have the language to describe a lot of these identities. Like Alex has mentioned, I agree. I think that we do now have the language for that. Um, I also feel that because uh, LGBTQ people are also more accepted and able to venture into non-queer spaces as well, this need for an, a completely inclusive space of um, lesbians maybe isn't as necessary. So the sapphic space now becomes more of a community space where uh, more all types are, are welcomed. And, um, and as Angela said, the pandemic definitely made a huge difference of folks like realizing like, gosh, you know, we need to get out, we need to get together, we need spaces, but it's a different type of space now. Yeah, one of the things, um, nobody's darling, we were very intentional about saying that we are a women-centered uh, bar. We frequently were being interviewed and we would say we're a women-centered bar and so then we would read in the paper lesbian bar um, and that was a bit frustrating not because I identify as lesbian um, and my partner is queer it we felt that lesbian was very limiting and it was excluding in some way and we want it to be um, inclusive and women-centered said that if you, um, if if we center ourselves on women and we say that this space is safe for women, um, it means everyone is everyone is welcome. But this is a space for women, and so if you come into this space, there is a respect you must have for women. How, however, where you know wherever you are on the spectrum. Um, and that has been very successful because people seem to understand that. Uh, and I think that um, as, as someone who has been, who has tried very intentionally to keep up with all of the different names and, you know, changes of, um, it, it doesn't matter. It's like you, you just, you welcome, you open your doors and you welcome everyone in. And I think that's how the bars have had to change. Um, and lesbian bars have, you know, kind of led the way in doing that uh, historically, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Those excellent answers. So I think what we'll do now, just um, to make sure we get have enough time, is move into some specific questions I have for each of you. Uh, and since I, I, I guess I'll start with Alex, since you brought up your uh, excellent uh, NBC News article, uh, which really brought this event together. Um, so you recently wrote this article on the new generation of lesbian bars. Um, I suppose, what drew you to this topic and what did you find most surprising about investigating the article? Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I just want to shout out the NBC team. This was really like a huge team effort to get this story across the finish line with this video we watched and with all of the visuals. So can the NBC folks who are involved with this, we have Justine, whose idea it was. We have Brooke, my editor. Yeah, Jillian, <laughs> Casey over here who produced the video. Really was like all hands on deck for this story. Um, so, uh, I'm, now I'm trying to remember um, the question. Yes, what, uh, what actually, so first of all, I think one of the things that has always drawn me to reporting on these spaces is that I just revere lesbian bars and queer spaces so much. I, there are a few places that I can think of where you can both like throw down on the dance floor and get ready for a protest. And for me, <laughs> you know, they've really, these spaces have held such multitudes for me in terms of where I go when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I, when I feel like I need a place to resist whatever is going on. Um, 
But that said, for me, since I came of age sort of in the 2010s, and that's when I first started going to these spaces, the narrative that I always heard about uh, lesbian bars and women-owned queer bars was that it was a scarcity narrative, was that uh, you know they peaked at around 200 in the 1980s. I think a historian told me that Los Angeles had like a dozen lesbian bars at one time. Can you even imagine? Um, and then all that had been told to me was like, there are no more lesbian bars. You have two lesbian bars that you can go to. Lesbian bars are dying out. So I think learning the history in this story was one thing that surprised me, that just there was a period of time when lesbian bars uh, were really thriving. And then also now, uh, one of the genesis, the genesis for the story was that there's like at least a dozen new lesbian bars, uh, queer women owned bars, women centered bars that have opened up across the country. And so it also surprised me that now we're sort of in this moment where I think people are really naming that these places have been closing and that that is just a huge loss. And people are looking around and saying like, I really love these spaces, why don't, why don't I open one? So I think that that was one of the big things that I learned and that makes me feel really, really hopeful. Thank you. Since you brought up the general inter, uh, sort of general evolution, I, I think it, maybe we should move to Wanda to talk more about the local uh, evolution. So Wanda, you've been producing events in New York City for over 30 years. How has the lesbian bar scene evolved during this time and are there any local policies or other changes that have made it easier or harder for the spaces to survive? Um, yeah, sh I <laughs> first started going to, uh, my first gay bar was in the 80s, and, um, or lesbian bar, actually, and it was called Peaches and Cream, and it was um, uptown somewhere. And I, I have a vague recollection of what it looked like, but I remember that I was so new to the whole scene that I was like super nervous, and I saw the whole crowd, and you know, I, th I don't even think I got a drink. Maybe I got a drink and I walked out. I was just like really nervous. And, and then subsequent to that, um, I think I went to the original Cubby Hole, which is now where the Henrietta Hudson space is. And um, that was a small space downtown. I felt more familiar with it. And th these were the bars that were around at the time. It was, uh, at least at when I first went out. So it was Peaches and Cream. Um, a place called Network, uh, the, <laughs> the Duchess. Oh, I, I miss Casa Maria. I miss Sahara. I love Leslie Cohen, the late Leslie Cohen. Um, uh, Henrietta's wasn't there yet, and yeah, Duchess, which then became Pandora's box. But so. Um, while they were, I was really excited that they were there. There was. You know, the, it didn't resonate with me like as a place that I would go to all the time because I was looking for uh, more diversity, and that was changing. You know, we were doing these, you know, historically the the the, the gender roles, you know, the butch femme thing, and and this and the uniforms that we would use to be able to identify each other. But things were shifting, and um, things did shift. And in the early '90s, there was this resurgence of spaces. Uh, you know, we then did get Henrietta's, and there were parties and 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 different like weekly parties. It, it was huge. The city was also not as gentrified as as it has now become. Uh, it was affordable. There was a huge queer and creative community downtown, and um, it was an it was an incredible, wonderful scene. Uh, how has that shifted? Well, we know how that has shifted. I mean, the city has shifted completely. You know, it's com it's impossible to, almost impossible to open a bar in New York City, to open any kind of commercial business right now. And also, the, the demographic has changed. A lot of people, ha it's become unaffordable. They don't live in the city. Uh, they're either in the outer boroughs or they've moved out, so you don't have the same patronage. You know, it, it has changed economically and um, and also in terms of how uh, LGBTQ people engage. You know, the digital media and the apps changed everything completely. So, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. I really do, the social media and apps seem to really have changed how 
uh, and people meet in community, I think, as well. So I think that's an important point to bring up. What I'd now like to do is move a little outside of New York City and talk about uh, the two bar owners we have from uh, out of state. So first for uh, Angela, much of the local news about your bar talks about its stunning success in Chicago, including your nomination for a, a James Beard Award and the fan base you've cultivated that even draws out of state customers from places like Wisconsin and Indiana. So can you tell us more about Nobody's Darling and the important space it provides in Chicago? I know you did some of that earlier, but if you can expand, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, um, it's my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, every time I talk about Nobody's Darling, it's, it is, it's surprising, the success. And one of the reasons is because, um, you know, again, uh, Renata Riddle, who is my uh, business partner, when we set about to kind of do this, um, we really did say that the worst case scenario, and it, this is not a big bar, Okay, this is, you know, um, in this really wonderful community in Chicago. Uh, the original space we just expanded had, I think, capacity of about um, 65, you know, now about 100. Um, and we, we said that the worst case scenario is that if people, if it's not a huge success, w the rent is low enough that our friends will come and drink and we can still pay the rent, um, and we know how to make some good cocktails. But, um, but it was successful, and the reason is, I think, because um, as two black queer women, um, we knew that uh, even though we love to go out and we love to go to bars and different things like that, we have we had the experience of being um, unwelcome, and of feeling as though wouldn't it be nice to make sure that when you walk into a space, you are acknowledged, um, you it is clean, it is uh, welcoming, um, and the next time you come in, people remember your name. Uh, the drinks are excellent. Uh, everything I think that we wanted, we put into the space. And that is, I think, what people felt. So it, we weirdly, I think, got a lot of press and we were able to sort of talk about that and it spread. And so we have people who, they do, they come from Wisconsin, Indiana, they come from Boston, they come from New York and really just come to really have that experience and we try to greet everyone. Um, but what has, I think has meant the most to us is that people say thank you for creating this space. And it took probably, I don't know, like maybe the 10th time for us to actually say, wait, we did create something because we just couldn't fathom that we had done anything, you know? I mean, it just, but then we understood that it was a, it, it was a community and it was more than just a bar. Um, and it was so important that, that our community felt comfortable. And when we had, um, you know, so much of the trans community coming in and, and also gay men coming in and saying, oh my God, we feel so comfortable here because we really don't want to be on Halstead Street. And, um, and especially, you know, gay men of color um, feeling so much more welcome in our space. So it, it's, it tells us that more spaces that are welcoming are needed. Um, we have people, you know, who are saying, wow, you guys are successful. We do, you know, we do think we, you know, more bars should be opening, um, you know, women-centered or lesbian bars. And we've always said, yes, you know, and we're more than happy to, yeah, let's talk about it. How do, you know, how do we get that, how do we get that going? Um, probably a lot easier in Chicago than New York. Um, but, you know, that's, that tells us that um, even though so many advances have been made, you, you know that there are so many areas of the country where our community is under attack and we are not comfortable, and so like we still need these spaces. So, 
Thank you for that. And that's actually a, a perfect lead in to my next question for Kathy. Uh, so I, as I'm sure most of us are aware, Texas has been the site of a lot of anti-LGBTQ legislation recently, especially legislation that targets trans youth. So why are lesbian bars like Sue Ellen's so important at this particular moment in Texas? Well, first of all, what can I say about Texas and its politics? Um, it's very frustrating, but I personally try really hard to use all that hate as my strength to try to make it better. Uh, I, I can only do so much in the, in the small area that we have in Dallas, but we are so diverse, and as, as we've all said up here tonight, we need to do everything we can. We, we went down to Austin, we fought for the drag queen bill, that was another one, they were trying to take, make all the drag, drag queens go away just because they of the drag brunches that were so popular in Texas. And we fought that, and we fought that, and we fought that, and we won. And we were fighting the trans bill at every step. So it's just, it, it's, it's I, I use it as my superpower. Every time I, I hear another bad thing, I'm like, it, it's gotta get better. And then I had somebody come up to me yesterday, or uh, day before yesterday, and she said, it's because of Sue Ellen's that I think I want to open my own bar. And I said, please, whatever I can do to help. Because, yes, we are the only lesbian club in Dallas, and that's not right. It should, shouldn't be that way. Um, so I'm doing everything I can, working all the time to be a, as diverse as possible, to accept anyone that wants to come in and have a good time, which many years ago, the lesbians were so freaked out every time they saw a man walk through the door. And I said, you know, as long as they want to have fun with us, why are you not accepting them? They're, you know, if they want to come in, I want them to come in. And when we had to shut down for the pandemic, the last person I saw walk out the door was a man going through, uh, he was transitioning. And I was, I said, you know, he said, how long do you think it's going to be? I said, you know, we, none of us know. It's all going to change, though, when, when we come back, because we're going to need all the help we can get. And we did that, and we got through it, and we came back. And who was the first person standing in line? And I said, you know, this breaks my heart. He said, I haven't felt, I haven't felt accepted anywhere but at Sue Ellen, so here I am. And so that just, you know, it's, it's, it's very emotional for me. But I think we just have to keep at it. Uh, we've got to get all these good old boys out of office and get some of these new people in and you know that support us. Because there are, are a lot of p politicians in Texas that do support us. And it is fairly easy to open a bar in Dallas, Texas. Um, it's expensive and not every, everybody knows how much work goes into it. We all do. <laughs> but. Um, I, I think I think we just have to keep at it, and I, you know, I'll fight it till my I, as long as I have a breath in my body, I'm going to fight. So, so now I'd like to just ask a question for Stacy. So this the subtitle of this event credits Sapphic Spaces as a Stonewall legacy. Uh, can you tell us more about the historic place that Stonewall holds for queer and trans women and non-binary people in particular? and the LGBTQ plus community more broadly. Sure, um, and first of all, you have to remember that there's so many movements and, and, and human rights movements all across the world, and ours is the only one that started in a bar, right? And that's why bars are so important, and that's why lesbian bars are even more important. Um, and I think that's critical to remember. This is, these are the places where we find our chosen family, these are the places that we use the vehicle to keep the fight alive that started you know, right down the West Village on Christopher Street in 1969. These are the spaces, places, and faces that keep that fight going, and we all have to remember that. Um, 
And we also have to remember that in 1969, the history of Stonewall will never quite know, but most historians will agree it was a lesbian who said, aren't you going to do something? Some say it was stormy, we're not sure, and I don't want to get into a history debate. Uh, but uh, most historians agree that it was a lesbian and who said, aren't you going to do something? And a lot of people then stepped in and started, started uh, fighting back for you know, one of the first times. And that was the spark that started the LGBTQ modern day rights movement and the revolution for equality all around the globe, right? So lesbians were there from day one of our movement and they were there for day one in our spaces. It's also interesting to know that uh, Stonewall in general, before in the 30s, it was called Bonnie's Stonewall, and it was a speakeasy. And that was typically a place where they would serve tea during Prohibition upstairs, which was also typically lesbian women, right? Uh, so there's a lot of tie into that with us in the movement. Um, I will also say when one of the first things that I did when I went in with my business partners, Kurt Kelly, Bill Morgan, and to, uh, Tony DeChico in 2006 was say, here's the deal. We're going to make Stonewall, which was typically at that point an older male gay bar, right? We're going to make it inclusive and we're going to lead with the lesbians. And they were like, absolutely. And we brought in folks like Girl Nation. We brought in folks, um, lesbian DJs. We brought in um, a trans pool league. We did everything that we could do to make sure that women and non-binary and trans folks really felt welcome um, uh, at Stonewall like they had in 1969. And that was super, super important for us. Um, We've done a lot of different interviews, and, and with NBC even, where my business partner have, and I have both said, once we got into the space in 2006, we had some financial difficulties, the, we had to redo the whole building, and if it wasn't for our specific lesbian nights on Thursday and Friday, we have both made it very public uh, and said that Stonewall wouldn't survive. If it wasn't for the lesbians, Stonewall would not have survived. So I'm here to tell you, not only did the lesbians start the riots at Stonewall, the lesbians saved it, and we are still saving it to this day as our lesbian nights are the most popular things happening at the most famous gay bar in the world, and that's that. <laughs> So we, we've now about reached the part of uh, the Q&A in the evening, but before I, we do that, I just, like, one last question. So we've all talked about sort of ebb and uh, flow of the um, uh, lesbian bars uh, throughout the country. Uh, what are some things that we can all do to help ensure that these spaces survive? Um, Drink more? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, def I mean, that's that's uh, the obvious is to support them. I think you know we have that you know stereotype that as lesbians we hook up and we get married and we don't go out anymore. You know, so like to to support support is 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 you know tantamount to like you know keeping these places open, but also um, when we we talked about the the lesbian bar project uh, as as a. A uh, vehicle that really exposed uh, the lack of of bars in in the in the nation, and um, I think that really lent gave it so much visibility and it made made people think about it. Like as I think people weren't thinking about it. Like oh, you know, well we can go here, we can go there. We weren't really considering that these uh, women centered sapphic spaces were gone. They were, all of them were disappearing. So uh, I think that also talking about it, being able to um, you know, let folks know that these places exist, supporting them, make, making yourselves visible as, as, as queer uh, women will also you know, help these places stay alive. And drink more. <laughs> um, I, I, I think just to support the ones that have been there for all these years, and for those that are coming up, the new ones, for sure. If there's a new lesbian bar in, in, in your area, make sure that you support because it's very hard. My wife and I did, uh, we opened our own bar restaurant for, uh, I think we were open for four years. And it is tough. I mean, I, I work for a corporation and, and I don't see what really goes into it, or I didn't until we did it ourselves. And thankfully, I had been in the bar business for so long that a lot of people knew who I was. 
And when they found out that I had opened a new bar away from Sue Ellen's, they were like, oh, she's trying to shut it down. And I, I was like, no, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm trying to do at all. I'm just trying to give us a choice. You know, Sue Ellen's was doing just fine without me there. But um, I went back uh, after we, we did close, not because we weren't successful, but because we lost our lease. Um, but I did go back to Sue Ellen's, and it, it just made me love it that much more because it had changed so much. Just in the eight years I was gone, it had changed so much, and it was a lot more inclusive. Trans, Gen Z, everybody. Uh, it was just a much nicer place to be. So please, if there's a new place, and if there's a place in your city or wherever, um, that's been around for a long time, they need your help. I was gonna add, in addition to going to all of these places, um, one of the big uh, reasons we explored in uh, the NBC story as to why it's so difficult for lesbian and women-owned bars to, to stay open is because of the wage gap. And so I think I, I was actually interviewing the author of Moby Dyke, which is a memoir of this woman who traveled across the country and went to every lesbian bar. Um, and she, one of the pieces of, uh, pieces of advice she had was that everybody should pick their lane and go forth, which is to say that she decided to go to every bar and write a book about it. For some people, that may mean amplifying these businesses um, on your social media or um, evangelizing them to your friends and, and letting them know that these businesses are not guaranteed to be here forever. And then there are these reasons, systemic reasons, like gentrification or like um, the gender wage gap that uh, are reasons why it's also hard for LGBTQ plus and um, women to own these different businesses. So I think there are many lanes that you can pick to fight to keep these spaces open. And I don't know, maybe even if you love them so much, like why not open one yourself as well? <laughs> and, and I would also add to, to that um, funding, right? So Because sometimes they need funding in particular. So if you can't go out seven nights a week, God knows I try. Um, but if you can't do that all the time and, and, and frequent these places, to Alex's point, making sure that you maybe try to do some funding or maybe you volunteer to help them out. Maybe you can do, maybe you're great at social media. You want to help that way. It really is a community and a chosen family that runs and builds these bars. So if you can't be there all the time, there are ways that you can get involved. And maybe if you don't have money, there's other ways for you to get involved and help keep these safe, sacred and sapphic spaces alive for us. Thank you so much. All right, so let's go ahead and turn it to the audience now for some uh, Q&A &A session. Uh, and we have someone uh, coming around with a, a microphone, so. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank all the uh, business owners for, for you know keeping, keeping these businesses alive. Uh, I just moved back to New York from Oklahoma, so it was really great to see so many great Oklahoma bars. Um, but I was wondering, the resurgence, is it, I mean, it's kind of surprising to, that so many bars are opening up in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Are they in the big cities? Are they in small rural areas? Is it all over the place? Um, where, where are the, where's the resurgence? So there, it's kind of happening all over the place. Um, in New York City, there's a newish bar called The Bush that opened a couple of months ago. Um, in uh, Florida, there's a place called The Ladies' Room that opened, I think, a little bit over a year ago. Um, there are new places in Portland. There are, I'm sure that I'm missing locations. Um, I think there are new places in DC. Uh, I, I can't remember all of them all the t off the top of my head, but it's definitely kind of happening everywhere, which is very cool to see. Um, and then it is also happening in, in, I think, like big coastal metropolises that some people may have preconceived notions where uh, assumptions that, that these bars would open. Go to nbcnews.com and <laughs> check out our interactive uh, map to see where they all are. Hi, um, it's great to see all the bars. Um, I was thinking uh, about the fact that I rarely go to bars now, which bums me out, I always wanna go. And why don't I go? Because one, I can't drink the way I used to. <laughs> and also, um, when I wanna go often, it's like I'm getting out of work and I wanna go and like have a coffee or do something like that. And I'm just, my question to you is, and I don't care about being with all the 30 year olds because you know, 20 year olds, because I'm, I'm of course an inner 30 year old. But in terms of like getting a more inclusive community, I mean, as women get older, we change how we socialize. And I have noticed that 
There's tons and tons and tons of coffee places open, but rarely do any of the lesbian spaces that I have gone to as I've gone around the country offer that. Either they're separate as coffee. And I'm just wondering what you all have done. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about like creating a space that is open in the day, not just, of course, alcohol is going to be one thing. It's great. But we do more than that. And there's also, I think, the other piece that I think about a lot, which is a lot of my friends are sober. And so it's tough for them when I want to go out. And I feel like there's a whole movement around sober drinking. And not, you, know, you don't want to counter what you're doing with an alcohol-based business. I get that. But I wonder how you think about it and what maybe you've done proactively to think about that for just getting a lot more business. Well, I can speak for Dallas. And uh, right three doors down from where Sue Ellens is, uh, our company has, is opening up a new bar. And it's going to be open at noon every day. And we are going to have a special menu for non-alcoholic drinks for those that want to come out and drink but not drink. And also coffee and any kind of non-alcoholic drink that they can drink. Um, so we're, we're getting there. It's taken a long time. I think we're way overdue for it. Because people, when people come up to me and say, you should do this, it's way past time. We should have done it. It should have been our idea. But I think you get so involved in what you're doing. It's, it's hard to run a bar. We, we've, all, we've all said that. So it, once you get in your lane, you kind of stay in your lane. And I should find, we are finding a new lane to go. So uh, it is happening. I, I think it's way past time, but it is happening. Yeah, what we've also thought about, it's a great question. Um, and what we do at uh, Nobody's Darling, we actually have um, on the menu um, non-alcoholic drinks. I think we have a really cute name for it. Um, and they're actually quite delicious. And so, um, and we also have, which is something we really appreciate, uh, it's a very intergenerational crowd. Um, I just, candidly, I'm older. I don't like to admit it a lot, but um, I am not at the bar too late. Um, and so, um, you know, you'll have people there. Um, a lot of, you know, my friends are sober. Um, and so um, there are, it, it, if you do stay at the bar long enough, you see this turnover, right? You see these different crowds that come in, you know, and you kind of can watch the progression. Um, and it seems as though given that, and I'm sure this happens in every city, you know how you have people have known, they've been in the community for a long time, you know, and so you have this group and this crowd comes in and then that crowd. Um, and some people drink and some people don't, but it still is that community space. Um, in because of Chicago, in the uh, spring and summer, we have an outdoor patio, and so of course, you know, people are outside, and that's a little bit easier, you know what I mean, than having the inside space. But we've thought through um, kind of ways in which it isn't just alcohol, um, but it's it is difficult because it is a bar, and we also try to have we do a lot with group, community groups as well, where we also give up the space to those groups so that they have activities or whatever that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, isn't focused on drinking, I guess, is the best way of saying it. But it still is hard because, you know, again, in our community, bars have been so, so, so much the focal point of community, it's hard to kind of move away from it, but we're still trying to create some room for people who are sober or who want to be in the space, have something in their hand, but it's still, and it isn't pretending not to be a really great cocktail. It's just that it, you know, something like that. Um, thanks for having this. I was like, kind of out of my mind, I'm going to go out in the middle of the week. I'm a, a busy uh, person, <laughs> and I'm going to be able to be with other people who um, can share the feelings we all have. Um, I want to uh, just uh, bring to light the, um, I'm a Hunter graduate, and I'm very proud, <laughs> very proud. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I, I went to school part-time for seven years and worked in the Duchess for seven years. And I was uh, schooled there. 
by Janet and Gail. Janet Werblow and Gail Perry. Gail was from Boston. And they taught me about life. And I was just a suburban kid with parents who threw me out at 19 and uh, nice Jewish parents. Um, and I needed a place to work. So for me, the Duchess and gay life was about work. I made a living. And I um, also <laughs> felt sexy. I mean, I think that when you think about, I'm a pediatrician and now actually studying <laughs> to be a child and adolescent psychiatrist. It's one of my mentors right here. And I'm 72. Um, and um, what I found about gay life was in the bar. It was how I could find my identity and how I could be my own person and how I could be a sexy girl. Because I wasn't a sexy girl in a straight context. I was class president <laughs> and, I was a <laughs> and I was a very good student, obviously, but I wasn't a sexy person, even though clearly inside of me was, you know, like a boiler room. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew, I knew it. And then there were the political aspects of the gay bar that were so amazing because I didn't really understand politics as a kid. I didn't know how to take it into my life. I didn't know how it related to me. But then there was, you know, the lesbian feminist liberation and uh, run by a former nun. Um, anybody remember her? I'll think of it in a minute, but Elaine Noble came into the bar, first lesbian congressperson. And lots of celebrities came into the bar, lots. Liz Smith, the gossip columnist, she was free to sashay into the bar and torture all the young women. <laughs> <laughs> and then on and on, there was a life there for Hasidic Jewish women who needed to have comfort and safety. And they were also call girls themselves. So there was complicated identities. There were the, 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 the life of, of people in the bar was really um, rich. And I loved learning. And I felt of all things to do in my life, that was my greatest triumph to boast that I was a bartender and a cocktail waitress in the Duchess. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. It was a, a wonderful uh, story. Uh, I think I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah. Thank you all. For oh, wait for the microphone. <laughs> Thank you all for for being here. I bounced for a minute at the Duchess. Um, N and not to detract, and the, the title here is New Generation, but there does feel in this conversation to be a little bit of an ahistoricity ahistoric about the prior generation, right? So there were women who felt the need. I mean, some of the lesbian bars were owned by the mob, but some of them were also women who wanted to create spaces. And um, I am intimately familiar with a space that was created in Brooklyn that was a bright, well-lit, women-only restaurant. I don't know if you guys remember La Papaya, any of you. <laughs> but it was also an incredible flashpoint for anger. The owner had sons, and the separatists didn't like that. And the Socialist Workers' Party didn't think that the lesbians should patronize the capitalists. And this is actually a, a lead up to a question for some of you. Um, and what did happen to that prior generation? Where did the ladybug go? Right, so accidentally it just disappeared because it wasn't supported because fill in the blank. But Stacy, you said that you thought the women were more inclusive, right? And Kathy, you mentioned, well, they kind of weren't. They were a little hostile. And then, you know, now there's this um, stereotype and stigma of the turf. But you were saying, you know, really it's the men who are seeming. So, I mean, I don't know. And so I think that there's a big question about how identity politics has changed, and I'd be interested in what you all think about how that plays into the place where we find ourselves now. Identity politics has a huge role in all of this, and you're, you're talking, and, and, and again, I think why we're having two different answers to this, one from 
somebody based in New York who's talking about the younger generation in particular are the ones leading on this. Gen Z are the ones really saying, hey, we're more inclusive. I think there's such a generational gap around this. It happens. If you look at anyone under the age of 30, um, so that's some millennials too, they're absolutely going to be super inclusive, super welcoming the whole time. Um, I think when you look back, and when I first was entering lesbian spaces in the 90s, we probably, it was a whole different thing. I'm, you know, I'm not Stonewall generation, but I'm not, you know, I'm Gen X, right? So in the 90s, when I would walk into space too, yeah, we would be like, oh, we don't want to see a man in there. No, it was vastly different. So identity politics plays a big role. I think politics in general plays a big role. And I think now that we see ourselves progressing more and more, the younger generation is becoming more and more accepting of everyone being in that space. Um, and when you use the, and, and, and TERFs, you know, should not be, <laughs> and I think that could be something that was probably something that happened with an older generation. But to me, that, you know, TERFs should not be um, some way that we identify whatsoever. I think we have to be super inclusive of our trans and non-binary folks. And I think it divides around an age gap. And I'm particularly talking about the younger generation is absolutely inclusive and wants to see every kind of person in their space. And women have led on that. Um, if you went into a gay man, a gay male bar in the 80s and 90s, I remember going to gay male bars, I, even as a lesbian, and didn't feel welcome either, right? And I think, again, I would still argue that men have always been worse. Um, so, so that's kind of what my point was. <laughs> And we also have to mention that not only was it in terms of like gender politics, but race also. I mean, I think that uh, the queer spaces in, in the, at least in New York in the 80s and 90s were very segregated. Uh, you know, there were the, you know, Latin and black spaces and then there were the other spaces and there was conflict. And even I, I remember in, in, at Starlight, when I, I had this bar, Starlight and Sundays was uh, ladies' night, and we there was like the beginnings of seeing the trans community and the top surgery, and, and there was there were issues like there was conf con confliction about what that meant, and um, you know this person was now somebody else with a different name, and uh, there was definitely not not hostility, but confusion and where everyone fit in within a lesbian space. It's changed now. All right, I think um, we're actually about out of time. I see we have, um, well, uh, we have like one more question. I, and I, I've seen this one, so we'll do one more quick question and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, close. I just, obviously there needs to be a history of lesbian bars. Um, all of the, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I first went to a lesbian bar in 1958, and it was called Page Three. I don't know what happened to Page Three, it disappeared. <laughs> but Page Three was an incre, I mean, it's where you went to pick up somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, by the way, Audrey Lord, who was my best friend and first lover, she too went to page three in the very early 60s and late 50s. So, I mean, thinking about what happened in the 90s is, is really, you know, obviously this is the story that needs to be told and I'm hoping somebody here Maybe looking for a dissertation or <laughs> <laughs> We're working Lays on a documentary film from the okay. 90s, so we'll have to keep you posted on that. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, um, I see. Um, do you have one more uh, quick comment? Brooke oversees all the LGBTQ coverage at NBC uh, Digital. So, thank you. Thank you, um, first of all, this was an amazing panel. Uh, but one thing, and um, thank you, ma'am, for your point about uh, the history of le of, le of lesbian bars. Um, you know, the work that we did on this project, and we've got the video producers here. Um, we would love to continue it, and there were some great stories shared in this room. 
Um, for the ladies who have stories about lesbian bars of yesteryear, if you'd like to share your story, um, my email is brooke at nbc.com. Um, I'd love to connect and, um, you know, Yes, sorry, B-R-O-O-K-E at NBC.com. Um, would love to, I'd love to talk to you some more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's Well, we, um, we do have a reception after this event as well, so um, it's, it'll be upstairs, so we can continue the conversation, and I, I think probably Brooke will be there, so you could reach out to, to Brooke as well. Um, I, I'd really like to just thank all the panelists for making this event possible, and NBC as well. Um, I'd also like to thank the LGBTQ, the CUNY LGBTQ Advisory Council and its president, Mitch Drazen, for bringing uh, this event to our attention, uh, as well as uh, Harold Holzer, the director of um, the Roosevelt House, and all of the amazing staff here who has helped make this event possible. Uh, we do have an upcoming event next week on Tuesday, uh, presenting uh, Paisley Kara and Zane Marib's new books, uh, Sex is a Sex Does in Terms of Exclusion, which are on um, uh, transgender rights and access and uh, evolution of LGBTQ identity, um, especially focusing on the 90s. Uh, so please do attend that event because we'll get into even more historical discussions with that. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending this evening. <laughs>